Okay. So um, yesterday, this is the second of three lectures on learning how to learn quantum cryptography. Uh, yesterday's uh, was a high-level overview of encryption, the basics of encryption without reference to the particular mechanism. And then towards the end, we um, discussed the Vernum cipher, and uh, I noted that that is the, uh, the version that's used in quantum cryptography or quantum key distribution, as we call it. And uh, the quantum process depends, uh, the generation of the quantum key distribution involves the generation of a secure shared key between, established between two parties who are communicating over an, a non-secure quantum channel. So the issue of the security is something we'll, we'll get to in the third lecture, but um, in order to understand how, how all this works, I've, um, it's necessary to understand quantum randomness, which in itself is a huge subject. It's even, you know, it, it, it's not a settled matter in my opinion. That's an active subject of research, uh, but we'll address it in the particular context of quantum optics which is the vehicle that's used for every implementation of quantum cryptography that's been made so far. And basically, quantum key distribution typically uses light as its communications channel because photons are one of the few particles that can travel uh, without uh, decoherence through, through the open air, a uh, great advantage in practice. Probably the only other one for which that applies in reality is the neutron. And uh, producing neutrons is, is not the most straightforward matter, especially for a cryptographic procedure. Hey, Charles? Yes. Qu quick question. So um, I'm not a physicist, so forgive me. But uh, so if I have a flashlight and I shine a flashlight, and you know, eventually, those protons disappear, right? So, I mean, if I'm a, if I'm in space and I shine a flashlight, you know, a hundred or a thousand kilometers away, I won't see that light, will I? You uh, see, yeah. yeah. So the answer to that is yes. And how does it happen? Uh, well, why don't I? We're going to start by properties of light. Why don't I address okay. that in the first section? So start, start with the properties of light as they have been observed. This is my most, you know, the most important point. Uh, I'm going to indicate how they, they were observed and what the implications are, but you're not going to get the deep theory of optics from me. I'm going to give you the essentials, which, you know, could be used most valuable as a mnemonic if you want to look something up. Uh, properties of light, and then there's something called projective measurement, which, which is a core concept of quantum mechanics, but it comes up very directly in an application that you might be familiar with. That is um, watching 3D movies with special glasses in the theater. Uh, then the properties of light and projective measure, measurement, uh, when they confront the quantization of light that is due to Albert Einstein, they have surprising co consequences. And we'll conclude with how those consequences are employed uh, in practice today for quantum number generation. So let's start with light. Here's a you know, nice picture that I got from Wikipedia, beautiful rainbow seen in Alaska. And uh, you know, I have to apologize uh, for anyone who's participating here that has severe visual disability, but you know, the properties of light are, are, the basic properties of light are familiar to, well, most everyone. Here's, here's a start on them. So the first, the first thing that we notice, I, I would say up to the end of the 19th century, virtually all experiments in optics, that is study of optical phenomena, were done using the sun as a light source. In fact, the 
the definitive experiments that I'm going to show here all use the sun. And so you can imagine uh, if you, you, you have a window shade, it's a bright day, this, and you pull the shade down to, to keep the sun out of the room. If you put a pinhole in the window shade, you'll see uh, a dot on the far wall where the light travels from the sun right through the pinhole and more or less in a straight line through the wall. And so that's the experience that light travels in straight rays. And we can see things very far distant from us. I'm looking out the tree in the window now, looking at a tree about, I guess about 100 meters away. And I, I know where that tree is. And the light is coming directly into my eye from that tree. Now, uh, Terrell raised a question about uh, what happens if we Let's, let's, let's take this, a, a case of a laser pointer, which will make a very sharp, uh, bright spot on a wall that's close by, and ask us, what happens if we shine a laser pointer at the moon? Does the light in the laser go all the way to the moon? Well, uh, some of the light... <coughs> Air does scatter light slightly. So even the clearest air, light in a beam will scatter off an air molecule and be taken out of the path of the beam. And then it might scatter elsewhere. So light is lost to the beam by processes of scattering by material particles. Even if you're in vacuum, you're saying outer space where you can ignore the presence of things like dust and gases. Um, if you if you have a if you have a laser or any type of light source that's emitting, it's emitting basically a cone of of light rays. It's not it's not even a laser. Lasers is emitting in a monodirectional sense, but there's a finite aperture. So in fact, there's a there's a there's a di there's a small divergence of the beam, and eventually. Uh, the light ray will spread out because it contains, it's not just one unique ray, but a bunch of rays that are, are very closely spaced together in angle. And as you get sufficiently far away, the distance between the rays is that angle times the, uh, the product of the angle with the distance. So eventually, all light uh, gets lost from the beam under any circumstance, we know that. But, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about doing quantum cryptography, so we want to be operating in a condition in which we do have good, well-focused uh, light, and that's, uh, you know, that's been realized. You use lasers or you use optical fibers, and so under those conditions, we see that light travels uh, with a well-defined, we call a wave factor K, it's a well-defined uh, direction of movement of the beam. You can think of it, it's the, the, it corresponds to the momentum of light. Now, I have a question for you. I will not, I'm going to ask the question, and I'll wait to hear an answer before I proceed. Can we change the color of light? If not, why? If so, how? Please provide an example. Anyone? We have a few on the chat. By passing it through a prism, redshift. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, let's say those are those are great answers. Uh, here's a kind of a duh. We just take a, a red piece of red glass, pass this white light through it, we get red light. Happens, oh. all, happens <laughs> all the time. Happens all the time. Yeah. Well, but what, what are you doing with that? Does that red glass take the white light and make it white? I mean, make it red? And if so, how does it do it? And this is a, this is a, so light and color have been known since 
ancient times, right? The, the Romans are making colored glass. The Egyptians are making colored glass. But there wasn't, the first clear understanding of the nature of color was obtained by an experiment on sun, conducted on sunlight by Isaac Newton, who shined light through a prism. And this is, I'm showing you uh, stills from a very a wonderful demonstration uh, you can find on YouTube. It's from MIT in the lower left-hand corner of the, um, uh, here's, the, here's the, the title of it. So I've just, this is snippets from prism. Newton put light through a prism, and he found, as you see here, you don't see it too clearly in this ray, but when it's spread out, you can see the white light is spread out into a band, the familiar color of the rainbow going from violet to red. And then, uh, although it's not shown here, what Newton reported was that if you took this dispersed light and then you picked out, you, you, put, you put a little pinhole on this card in a patch of the blue, and then behind the pinhole, you put another prism, so the blue light went through the other prism, then there was no further separation of the blue. In other words, this blue light behaved as a pure undivided color when you put it through a prism. That's pretty amazing. But not only that, uh, Newton showed that you could disperse the light by a prism. So all the colors were spread out. And then with the use of a lens, you could put it through another prism and get back the pure white light. Does this remind anyone of something they must have done already several times today? Anyone? When did you last do this? Or, put it differently, when last did you cause this to be done for your benefit? Well, probably any time you pulled up a web page or made a telephone call, sent a text message, you were engaging the global telecommunications network. And it's this very principle called wavelength division multiplexing in which uh, you have a, let's say, a white light you know, the, the optical fiber, uh, the main trunk optical fibers carry pulses of light. But these pulses, when looked at closely, it's, oh, you've heard of FM radio, frequency modulation. The FM radio band, you tune a dial. I'm sure some of you still remember FM radio. You tune a dial and you get to a particular frequency and you hear a distinct message. You go to a slightly different frequency, you, you get a different message. And so that type of um, modulation of a frequency band is used to multiplex different communications along the same uh, along the same fiber of white light. Well, it's not white, but it's a narrow band infrared that looks like white light. So this is um, this is an incredibly useful. Uh, cap engineering capability to be able to do something like this. So, Charles, so yes, sir. Are are you referring to so? Let's say uh, with that picture there. So let's say the white light con contains three songs. Uh, sure. A blue, right. A blue, a blue song, a red song, and whatever the other color is. Yeah. Green song. Mm -hmm. And I can take those three songs, put those three colors together, get white light and then send it through the prisms. It kind of gets parsed into three different routes, let's say. And then the other, the final prism there puts them back together again or something like yes. that. Yes, uh, yeah. so I guess, you, you, yeah, you might say you could start with uh, channeling, uh, you know, so let me just say this. The, uh, maybe I should go one step further and get to another property of light, and then return to answer this question, which I think will make it clear. I'll, 
I think it'll become clear. Okay. Well, I'll, 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 just, I'll just say it this way. We see a very narrow band uh, up in the, is my arrow showing here? This is a, yes. Okay. This is, this is a high resolution image of the spectrum of the sun with a lot of interesting structure going from red to blue. And that, <clears throat> that corresponds to a frequency spectrum that is uh, at a frequency of about 10 to the 14th, between 10 to the 14th and 10 to the 15th uh, cycles per second. So that compares to the FM radio band, which is 10 to the 100 megahertz, 10 to the 8th. So light has, um, it corresponds to oscillations of the electromagnetic field that are about millions, millions of times faster than FM radio. Who would like to name the, to suggest a frequency of another, of another electromagnetic appliance in common use? Something in the kitchen, perhaps. Uh, can you can you read the? Are there comments in the chat, Daryl? Do you mind? Yep. Microwave. Exactly. Microwaves about ten gigahertz. So light is at this very high frequency and so what you can do is you can modulate the frequency of light at something like an audio frequency so instead of being 10 to the 14th cycles per second it jumps around between 10 to the 14th plus 10,000 which is the same as 10 to the, it's still it's still green light to the eye you can't you can't discern those small changes in frequency, but all all light will travel, or all light within a given uh, a substantial wavelength band will travel in the common way through a fiber. So it's basically that this is this is the reason why optical fiber is the main band carrier for all uh, high speed communications. It's the highest uh, frequency source that's available for for communications, and it um, and it lends itself to uh, easy techniques of modulation. Okay, well now with this, sorry, with all this patter about the nature of color, who would like to, who would like, let's return to this piece of red glass. Okay, it changed the visible color of, of the white light. How did it do that? Uh, Terrell, are there any comments yeah. on the feed? Uh, let me see. Photons of incident light get absorbed by material and then electron gets excited to a higher energy state. And then it loses its energy and comes to a lower energy state and releasing lower energy photon or light with less frequency. Uh, we'll see examples of that. But the, the process that, that that person just described is what we call fluorescence, which often um, results in a, a new color of light being present that wasn't there before. Is there another another response? There's a, like if there are any electronic engineers in the audience, there's a familiar or audio engineers. There's a familiar name which describes this, in my opinion. Nothing coming through yet. Band, band pass filter. What this, what this red, uh, red filter has done, it, it, has, it has reflected or blocked all, you know, so look, in the upper left-hand corner, you see there's a, there's a band from red to blue. So basically this, filter passes the red. It doesn't actually change any color of these passive filters, dye base filters, which are used in the, uh, the uh, cell phone, mobile cell phone cameras for color vision, do not, they just block, the, they absorb 
light of the color that you don't want. So this is just, what do you call it, a, a red band pass filter that allows the red to pass. And you might, I mean, I don't get too distracted about colors, which can be a subject of endless fascination to any thinking person. But, you know, we, we know that, I guess, anyone who's made a PowerPoint presentation, like I did recently, by the way, has used, like, the RGB picker to pick a color. You know, you, you've got this, the way you define a color on the computer office in terms of the red, the green, the blue content. These have values from 8, bit, eight bits per color, uh, you know, in a, uh, number between 0 and 255 RGB. So 255, 0, 0 is red, 0, 255, 0 is green, 0, 0, 255 is blue. And then there's a, there's a complementary a set of complementary colors, which are the, the twos complement. Actually, the exclu you might say the exclusive or of the um, of the uh, red, green, and blue. Does anyone know what the complementary colors to red, green, and blue are? Negative red, negative green, and negative blue. Yes, those are good names. <laughs> uh, and any common uh, Indo-European language names for those three colors? I'm watching the chat. But while while they're thinking, may I just inter interject a quick question in this Certainly. Space? So, so the material, the filter material, uh, I've never really thought about it this deeply. Thank you for taking me here. Could I, should I be thinking it's really letting through a range of frequency colors, so, you know, there, there, or is it, you know, or is there a perfect red, like, you know, red yeah, so, is this frequency and not a, a range of 10 megahertz or whatever. The, yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a convention. There are conventions in the display and the graphic arts and the pigmentation communities hmm. on this. And so uh, the color, you know, the human, this would be the subject of another talk that doesn't have anything to do with quantum computing. But the human eye has three primary color receptors, which are broadband in themselves. But one is sort of broadband in the red, one is broadband in the blue, and one is broadband in the green. And so in the you know, manufacturing of objects or making things that are pleasant to look at, you want to use uh, color sensations that people are familiar with and have a maybe even an emotional resonance. And so those are not pure colors like a laser would produce, but they're typically a band of colors. Mm -hmm. So this red that you see here, let me just say, this is, is pure red in the system of primary colors, red, green, and blue. But in the complementary system, it is exact, it's actually a mix of two of the complementary colors. Mm -hmm. I just saw a buzz on the feed. Let's see if someone's yeah. come up with a complimentary name. Yeah, George uh, stepped up and has blue dash green space orange space yellow. That I I will accept that as good enough, and I'll just right. offer I'll offer the uh, in exchange the conventional designation, which you can also find in your color pick, picker. These are cyan, yellow, and magenta. Okay, so yellow. Oh, yes. Yellow is the easiest one to see. If you look at the in the in the upper left hand corner here, ye yellow is called not blue. So if you were to block out, if you had a a white light, and you you've heard of these things, the blue blocker sunglasses, they block the blue because you know there's some lesser visual acuity in the blue part of the spectrum. And what you see is yellow. And then, uh, uh, what? oh yeah, not red, that is what you do if you block out the red. 
and that gives you the color cyan, which, you know, some people looking at, at blue, at, at cyan will say it's blue. No, it's not blue. It's not red. And the most gorgeous of them all, in my opinion, is magenta, which is what you get when you block out the green middle. So you get something that's sort of half red and half uh, blue. And so red in, in, that, in that other system, the RGB system is used for active displays like your computer screen. The CMY is used for passive systems like in printing, color printing, the typical process they put down uh, a, a, a cyan, magenta, yellow, and black matrix, which, you know, basically the light you see from the print is reflected white light, which, uh, uh, reasons I guess I can't really explain fully, is a better metric for uh, visual acuity than <coughs> RGB. Okay, let's see. I'm okay. So we have the we have the direction, and then we know that there's a that there's a color. And again, once again, you saw this in this Newton thing. You know, you pass you you spread it out spreads out and then you put it back, you get what you put in. So this kind of lossless thing where you can recombine them co coherently. And you can imagine doing experiments where you block out, you, you could discover this complementary system of colors by taking you know, a little a, a business card and blocking out the blue in this beam. So then in the recombination, you should get white light minus blue, which would be yellow. Be kind of a cool experiment. Too. Okay, what else do we know about light from observation? And mind you, you know, there was no theory that I know that gave this description of color. It was discovered experimentally. It can't be derived from some other first principles. I mean, when you know electromagnetism and all that, you can back predict light, but it's an experiential discovery. Another experiential motif is the, is the behavior of waves. Here's a very nice picture of waves that are gotten by throwing uh, pebbles into a pond at two different locations. And you can see that there's this characteristic um, uh, circular spreading of a wave from an initial disturbance in the water. And if you do another such disturbance elsewhere, you get a similar wave pattern. And they've overlapped. You can see in regions of the overlap, you see something that uh, it, it reflects a combination of these two different wave disturbances. But you can you can see once they once they leave each other, they retain the same character they had. So they don't. These are waves that can be superposed, and to some extent, they're independent. Except that if they coincide in a different point of space, then they cause a more complex disturbance. But otherwise, they just continue along as if there was nothing there. So this is, this one picture so shows the idea very important to quantum theory of superposition and interference. Here you see you have the wave from one stone. That is a state of motion of the water. The wave from the second stone is also a state of the motion of the water. And those two things can be produced independently. You could have one and not the other, or the other and not one. And when you produce them, you know, in proximity, then you, you see something like the original undivided character, but also with extra effects of the interference of, of wave motion in the places where they overlap. Are there any comments on the board? I keep seeing that number going up. No, you're okay. You're okay. So uh, Thomas Young, 
an experimental genius. Uh, Uh, was responsible for the, the great discovery uh, concerning light. And once again, he, uh, he used the sun as a source. This is, often, this is often referred to as the Young Double Slit Experiment. You can read it in his own words. His collected works are available on Google Books. And, it's, uh, you know, for those who are thrilled by such things, it's just such a thrilling account. He um, had a a darkened room with a, you know, a, a, a screen, and the screen was exposed to the, the sun, the king of the solar system, shining in from outside. And he put two little pinholes in the screen, uh, sh shown by A and B here, and then he had a, a card. Uh, he wanted to see the, 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 the structure of light from the sun uh, as it went through these two holes. I think he also had a um, a blue filter so that he was going to look looking just at the the blue light that came through those two holes. And what he saw was this um, well, the overlapping wave motions are shown here, but what he saw uh, on this viewing card, was an alternating set of bright and dark spots. Not just the two whole, if you had, you know, some sort of little light particles going through these holes, you'd get a stream of them from hole A and a stream of them from hole B. And, you know, maybe you'd get one spot or two blurred spots that overlapped. But instead, Young found regions of bright light alternated by regions of dark light. So it's pretty astonishing uh, that you know you have light coming through one hole, and let's say it it illuminates it illuminates it it, it illuminates a spot between C and D. Now you open up another hole so that more light, more light is coming from, more light is coming towards the bright spot between C and D than there was from just hole A alone. But what happens? That spot turns dark. How can adding more light make things dark? It just is, it's easy enough to see that when you um, do the mathematics of wave motion, but it's, it's just as I have done, it's possible to give an explanation that sounds, that sounds plausible, but seems to be contradictory. In any event, from this diagram, you can infer that, so this diagram has two scales of length in it. So one is the distance between the holes A and B. You see, we're talking, this diagram, the light is coming from the left, the sunlight. A and B are holes. So uh, there's a distance between A and B, and then there's a distance here uh, you can see between the, the circular bands. That's the same as the distance between these crests in the water pond that I've rotated by 90 degrees. So that's the wavelength of the wave motion that we call. And so from the knowledge of the distance of the two points and the observed pattern, you can infer the wavelength. There's a simple equation for that called the diffraction equation. And from that, Young inferred that the wavelength of light, and he did, actually, he inferred there was some type of wave motion. He didn't know what, what it was a wave of, except he knew, it was a, he knew it was a wave, and he knew the speed of light. At least he knew a, a good approximate value of that. Um, so, but he could, he could determine the wavelength, which turned out to be 
500 nanometers, half a micron, you know, something like a 30th or 20th of a width of a human hair. And from that he could, in, he was also able to infer the frequency of light from knowing the speed of light. Okay, so those two, uh, those are the two kind of evidentiary things we have. There's a, 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 a direction of light uh, that's, you know, more or less a well-defined quantity in, in ordinary experience. And there's the wavelength. And now there's a, um, a third aspect, which is uh, critical for this discussion, this issue of projective measurement. It's the polarization of light. And I have, um, I have a brief, uh, a brief film clip here that I'm going to try to uh, show. And, and basically what you're going to see is a, is a, a demonstration. Now, I, I can't really do this from the desk that I'm sitting at at home without having a complicated uh, setup. But it's, um, it's a demonstration that utilizes a pair of uh, 3D movie glasses. These were, I, I for, uh, like I uh, uh, forgot to put these back in the bins uh, about five years ago. I went, went to a commercial 3D movie. And uh, there are two pairs of these glasses uh, and then the light source behind it is a flat panel display. So if you have uh, any of, if you also forgot occasionally to throw some of those 3D movie glasses into the bin, you can try this experiment at home. Or if you have a um, typically prescription sunglasses are also polarized and you can, you can do experiments with those. Of course, of course you'll have to forget twice. Uh, yes, well, one is one is so often forgetful, is one not? Especially as one gets older. Actually, these are to, to, in in the if, if fair in, for fairness of disclosure, these are an older type of um, glass that used. Well, I'll I'll get to that at the end. Okay, maybe so maybe buying some certain cereals might. Remember, I used to have the glass. Yes, that's right. Cereal. That's right. That's right. Now let me uh, let me try and start this video. Oh, here we go. Don't forget the button on the left. I won't. And now let's see. Uh, share computer sound. Okay. This should work. Hello everyone, I'm Charles Clark yep, from it's good. Quantum Physics, and today I'm going to show you examples of projective quantum measurements using some objects with which you're probably familiar. This is an ordinary flat panel display, maybe similar to the one on which you're viewing this video. And then I have here a set of 3D movie viewing eyeglasses. These glasses, as you see here, pass the light with a little bit of attenuation from the display but when I change the orientation, one of the lenses is blocked and the other remains transparent. Uh, I, I have another pair of such glasses mounted in a fixed position here, which we'll, we'll use a bit later. And what's going on is the, the light from the display is polarized, and so with one orientation, uh, this lens blocks the transmission of light. It stops it, this one passes it, and then 90 degrees away, the other polarization is passed. And this is used in the 3D movies because they have a system of broadcasting two optical signals of different polarization. And they're displaced on the screen, so you get the illusion of uh, three-dimensional vision. Now, when this light is blocked, if I take an you know, ordinary, well-prepared transparent material and put it uh, in between the display and the, the eyeglass, then you see things occur as you would expect. But if I take some other more complicated but transparent object like this espresso cup, then you can see putting it in front of the, the blocking lens actually allows a lot of the light to pass. In fact, if I take, even if I take another polarizer, you can see that 
putting this other polarizer, which may even be the opposite polarizer to the one that's in use, allows a lot of the light to pass. And this is because when light passes through a polarizer, it takes on exactly the polarization of the pass axis. And so changes in the polarization here allow uh, light to, to escape through. And this is the principle of projective quantum measurements, which say that when you make a measurement on a state, you actually are creating that state in the measurement basis that you used. So this is the basis of quantum cryptography. It'll be subject of a later lecture. I hope to see you in class. OK. So let's see, am I muted? No. You're OK. Uh, let me, uh, let, let's go back to the, uh, the presentation. Looks good. So, okay, that, so here's where we were. Now let's, um, let's, let's, let's look at what was shown in that previous video from a simpler perspective. And, uh, you know, I'm going to summarize the relevant properties so, you know, what we understand, you know, about 50 years after Young's discovery of interference, that light was some sort of wave, uh, James Clark Maxwell showed that uh, the frequency of the, the speed of light was the same as the speed that would be predicted, the speed predicted and measured <clears throat> of electromagnetic waves, which were a completely different type of experience. I mean, the electromagnetic waves that were studied by Maxwell's, Maxwell were, you know, more, more or less like, the, you know, even uh, longer wavelength than the radio waves, which we encounter today. So they had, as an experiential phenomenon, they had zero connection with light. But in terms of like, you know, the equations of motion that they satisfy, they turn out to be, they turn out to be uh, beautiful examples of electromagnetic wave motion. And what characterizes them? Well, let's see. We already talked about the wave vector here. Uh, that's the direction of propagation. Here, oh, here, what we're, we have these two uh, individuals making wave motion in a suspended rope. I'm sure you, you know, you've done this when you were kids. You can make waves that go back and forth. And so the waves are propagating along the axis, the wave vector axis shown by the vector k. And then there's something called the electric field, which is the thing that is oscillating. Uh, and that's, you know, that electric field is like pointing down here, it's zero here, it's up here, down there, zero there, down, zero, up, down, so on. So the direction of the electric field for light and for electromagnetic radiation in general is perpendicular to the, um, the axis of propagation. And this is, this is, well, actually, I'm going to show you a, an analogy of uh, this type of motion to electromagnetism in just a moment, but I'll mention that, you know, for example, these these two individuals could also be shaking the rope so that, say, say it's going up and down here, they could also be shaking it so it was going back and forth, and they would get the same sort of thing. They get the same k vector, but now with the electric field director, electric field vector being parallel to the ground, or they could do it at any angle with respect to the vertical, and you'd still get the same, um, same type of motion. So in other words, the electric field vector has to be orthogonal to the propagation, but otherwise it can, it can, be, it can, be, it can be in the full plane that is 
is perpendicular to the propagation vector. That's a that's an, a very important uh, point because it gives us a degree of freedom for choosing uh, polarizations that would be exploited in quantum key distribution. Any questions on this? Nothing in the chat. Let's go to the cartoon. So okay. here's 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 like a, a cartoon of what I was just saying. Uh, you have you have a, a person uh, swirling a rope around, you know, going through this plane here, and in this plane, the the oscillations of the rope can occur in any direction in the plane, and the eye will see them as transverse uh, waves. Okay, so now let's say we um, we have a rope. We once again we have a rope, and we we put a picket fence. We put another another fixed viewpoint here, and then we put a picket fence. Uh, that's you know the the rope is going through one slab of the picket fence, and now we're going to be oscillating the rope back and forth. And um, and see what happens. This is an analogy to optical polarization. That is, I mean, it's it's not completely inaccurate. Okay, so you know, if we if we have the rope uh, passing through a slat fixed on the other end, and we wave it up and down parallel to the slat. And you know we we're, we're careful. Then that wave will pass right through the slat of the picket fence. And on the other side, we'll see the same wave. It's as if, as if the picket fence weren't there. Now, what if we we have the rope that's you know it's it's free it's freely it's it's in the gap between pickets, but we're shaking it from side to side. Well, then intuitively, you'd say, well, what's going to happen then? It's like the rope, it's almost, if the oscillation is in this direction, it's almost like the rope is hitting a, a hard wall, and it, it, it won't penetrate through, but it'll be reflected by the picket fence. Okay, now I'm going to draw a third arrow on this figure. Someone predict, please, what the arrow that I draw is going to look like. That's not a fair question. Well, let's just say I have, I've chosen two particular directions where I could, I've given you an intuitive uh, answer for the question of what goes through the picket fence. In one case, you know, it's plausible that the entire wave motion goes through. And the other case, it's plausible that none of it goes through. So, well, I'll just, you know, exercising my free, freedoms of American. Oops. The internet site reports the, oh, there we go. Oh, right. okay. So look, I'm going to put it at an angle. Oh, well, I'll just make it. This is just an angle. Let's say this is sort of like a 45 degree angle. Now, what's going to happen with the rope in this case? Are we going to see motion on the other side? And if so, what kind? And if not, why not? This is an experiment that you could actually do. I've done it. It doesn't yield, it doesn't have the complete clarity of the uh, optical results. But I'd say uh, for those who've had a physics class, uh, there's kind of a, this is kind of a natural, um, what's going on here? I'd like to, I'd like to say I'll see half of it. Yeah. So here's here's the um, here here is the, here is sort of the standard physics answer, it, so-called resolution of forces. So if you have basically 
the the vertical motion passes the horizontal motion is blocked well this this uh, 45 degree motion or maybe it's closer to 30 I don't know is basically a superposition of vertical and horizontal motion that is when this thing is going up along its trajectory it's moving simultaneously vertically and horizontally do you see so the vertical part is unaffected and the horizontal the horizontal part is suppressed and so basically um, we get we get a motion the wave is diminished the the transmitted wave is has a smaller amplitude than the instant wave in this case it's by a, about a factor of two and furthermore what's seen on the other side is the only wave that you see on the other side of the fence has the same direction of oscillation as the pass axis of the fence this is this is why it's called projective measurement so another way of thinking about this is that a wave incident on the fence creates a second wave on the other side of the fence and that second wave on the other side of the fence has only the one direction of propagation that's allowed through the fence the so-called pass axis of the wave and the and the amplitude of that uh, wave on the other side the ratio of the amplitude of the transmitted wave to the um, the instant wave the, the ratio of the transmitted energy to the incident energy is cosine squared of the angle between the incident wave and the pass axis Is there any, any comment on that? Does it seem plausible or ridiculous? Or who's, who's to argue with nature? Somewhere in between. Anybody? <coughs> or, your mics are open. Yeah, so the uh, summary conclusion, I think I just said it transmitted wave is polarized along the pass axis and then most importantly an observer who only can see the waves on the other side of the fence here only sees wave motion in one direction so in some sense there's there's no there's no information contained in those waves about the nature of the incident wave well if you knew the if you knew the amplitude of the incident wave on the outside and the amplitude on the inside then you could say something about the ratio of those two amplitudes but from a standpoint of zero knowledge with, without knowing what happened what what came through the polarizer you don't know anything about it except oh you know one thing it wasn't blocked so if you see something on the uh, you see a wave on the uh, inside of the fence, you know that the wave on the outside of the fence wasn't perpendicular to the pass axis. So that's kind of an important piece of knowledge. Okay, now let's see. This is all this stuff sounds pretty deterministic so far, right? I was talking about things that we've measured and I've carefully measured and ropes and fences and nothing random about any of this. So uh, what changes that is this amazing I uh, I won't say it was a discovery of uh, by Einstein, but he, in 1905, he wrote a paper 
was absolutely phenomenal. It explained three important experiments whose results were a mystery. And Einstein, and they're a very different type of mystery, by the way. And Einstein explained each of these three mysteries that he he showed that each of these these mysteries could be explained by one common assumption. And I've th these are not the words I've expressed this. Uh, oops. This, these are my own words. Einstein didn't use the word photon in his paper, but basically Einstein said that light is not a classical, not the classical wave that we think it is, but it consists of indivisible quanta of energy. And these indivisible quanta, they have an energy which is given by the product of something called Planck's constant and the frequency of the light. The frequency is just the speed of light divided by its wavelength. And so there are all these, basically, instead of having these wave motions, we have these, these, these quanta, whatever they are, but they're, they're necessarily indivisible and they contain, you know, one quantum is constitutes the minimum non-zero value of the quantity of light. So it's kind of like, you know, the sand on the, sh the so water, you know, water is this fluid, right? You, you go to the beach, you run your hands to the, the ocean water, you can see your hands there, and everything is clear. There's no structure in the water that you can discern. Uh, and so, uh, you know, even, even as tightly as you hold your fingers together, some water will see through it. But the sand at the beach is rather different. It is kind of, you know, it, you can move your hands through the sand, but you can see that there's kind of, the sand is composed of grains. And that means, you know, you can actually, you can hold sand in your hands fairly securely without any of it leaking out because you just need to make the closures between your, your fingers smaller than the grain. You can see those grains. There are no grains of water you can see. So, um, well, if you look at the, the numbers that Einstein gives here, the value of Planck's constant, which is, has been measured subsequently by other means, and the speed of light, what you find is that if this hypothesis is true, you can say, well, why didn't we notice it before? And, uh, you know, one thing to note is that given these numbers, we, we know what the, the normal uh, flux of sunlight on the Earth is. It, the power uh, that the sun deposits on the surface of the Earth, they, they, you know, this, the average over a year is about 1.4 kilowatts per square meter. That's a measured quant uh, quantity. So if you take these numbers and say, okay, how many of these photons are passing through a square meter of the Earth's surface per second? The answer is it's four times 10 to the 21. I mean, we don't even have a name for 10 to the 21, or maybe we do, but it's one that no one has heard of, right? It's a very large number. So these, these quanta are really, really small, okay? That's why they hadn't been seen directly before. They were just below uh, the threshold of ordinary perception. What you might say, like the, the waters of molecule, molecules of water in the ocean uh, are, are not perceptible, whereas the grains of sand are. Okay, now, what is the consequence for this? 
Okay, well, I'll just ask you. We can now ask the question, well, suppose we have a single photon that we send towards the polarizer. What's going to happen? Okay, if we send it along the pass axis, we just say it went through. If we send along the blocked axis, we just say, huh, it was blocked. What's the big deal? Well, if you send a single photon so that, let's say the classical measurement tells you that you choose an angle so that half of the light was passed and half was blocked, then what happens? Because according to Einstein, the photon is the minimal energy. So you have light on either side of the fence. It has to have energy of at least h times nu, or h c of light. It's an all or nothing deal. And Einstein is saying, this is a property of light. It's intrinsically quantized. So you can't subdivide the quantum. Well, you know, at the time Einstein uh, articulated his theory, no one had no one had an answer to that question that everyone else would agree with. What I mean to say is there was no existing principle of physics that you could use, of experimental physics or theoretical physics, that you could use to answer that question. Well, there's some intuition about it. The answer has been given to us by experiment. And it's, um, see, did I skip over something? No. Ah, yes. Here it is. I missed it. The answer is that in the case when you send a single photon, it is either passed entirely or it's blocked entirely. But the probability of those two outcomes is randomly distributed so that so that the probability that it's passed is the cosine squared of this angle theta the probability that it's blocked is one minus that which is the sine squared of the angle theta so in other words if you were to <clears throat> you know let's take these 10 to the 21 photons and send them through the polarizer what you're going to see is exactly what the classical theory predicts uh, is that, well, let's say for if, if, if the angle is 45 degrees, half of the, of the 10 to the 21st photons will be passed and half will be blocked. But if you send them one at a time, you'll see a set of random events where half the time the photon goes through, the other half the time. Blocked. So this, you know, this is um, from the standpoint of physics, or let's see, from the standpoint of physicists who are supposed to have an answer for everything. This was uh, this is kind of bad news because, like, okay, what determines that probability? Well, the answer is it's it's experimentally determined. And, you know, we can actually, uh, I'm going to sort of conclude with showing how that. How that's actually used for random number generation. So here's a beautiful device, widely used in optics. Many quantum optics experiments are used. It's two two prisms mounted together 
made of um, uh, uh, transparent material that was known. Because Wollaston invented this prism in the early part of the 19th century. And it has the property, uh, amazing properties uh, as follows. It's, it's called a polarizing beam splitter. If you take a beam of light that's coming in from the left here, we have a beam of light that's incident on this rear face of this crystal. And now let's say the photons in that light can be polarized in the horizontal direction or the vertical direction or any other direction in the plane that's defined by the horizontal and ver vertical uh, polarization vector. It goes through the Wollaston crystal and what comes out are two beams, one of which is purely vertically polarized and the other of which is purely horizontally polarized. Now, okay, that's an idealized description, okay? In, in the actual manufacturable Wallace prism, there's some imperfections. And so, you, you know, you might see, you know, you might get 99% uh, or 99.9% .9 vertically polarized or 99.9% .9 horizontally polarized. But uh, it's, you know, the indications are that for this physical medium, if your fabrication technology was sufficiently accurate, you would get this, get this outcome. And this can be uh, used to make a polarizing beam splitter. Now I had a very simple LED circuit um, that I used to illustrate uh, logical operations uh, using electromechanical switches in the previous lecture. And now we can say, okay, well here, let's take this LED source, let's, let's use it as a light source for a device that produces a stream of logical zero, well, a, a random stream of logical zeros and ones. How about that, huh? That sounds pretty cool. Uh, so this is a figure taken from a paper published by, by a group of Anton Seilinger 20 years ago. It shows two uh, schematics. I'm going to just talk about schematic B, which uses this polarizing beam splitter, uh, exactly the Wollaston prism that we described before in the previous slide. So we have an LED source. It's a light source. It goes through, and the LED produces you know, maybe semi-polarized, well, let's, let's call it, let's say it's, it produces unpolarized light. But the light goes through a polarizer that's set at 45 degrees between the horizontal and the vertical axis. So that means that the, uh, once again, if that, if that light is at 45 degrees, then it comes out at 45 degrees. And the 45 degree light is basically a superposition of horizontal, it's an equal superposition of horizontal and vertical. It's like if you add the horizontal and vertical vectors together, you get something at 45 degrees. So um, that means in the polarizing beam splitter, half the photons go to one photodetector and when this detector D1 detects a horizontal photon, it registers a count in this counter that's recorded as a logical zero. And when detector D2, that's just a symbolic meaning, it means logical zero means there was a count from detector one. And then um, uh, when a vertical, vertically polarized photon is is, count, is counted by detector two, it registers another count in this detector, and that records a logical one. And so now you can actually do an experimental test of the randomness of this source. You know, in a very, I mean, this is, to me, this, this is a fairly simple experimental diagram. 
you know, like maybe you should like draw a picture of it while I'm still talking or, or, or take the reference there and go and just, you know, study this diagram. It's not that complicated. And then, you know, when you go to this technical interview for the quantum computing company, uh, even if you don't, even if you don't finish lecture three and get to quantum key generation, they say, can you tell us how a quantum computer can factor prime number? You can say, well, uh, not so sure about that, but I think I can tell you how a quantum random number generator works. Like, this is maybe like the first, by the way, this is, this paper comes a report of a device that was made and worked. And arguably the first quantum information device that was made. Tell Anton Zeilinger I put in a good word for him. But this is like, I just, I just think this is a beautiful, beautiful, simple device with astonishing functionality. So how do you get it to operate how do you get it to operate for a single photon only? And that is just so remarkably easy to state. Usually you don't get any prizes for turning the lights off, okay? If there's no light, if there's no light from the LED, there are gonna be no counts. But if you reduce the current going into the light emitting diode, into the source, gradually, you know, for a high light flux from the source, counters D1 and D2 are going to be firing all the time. But as you reduce the um, intensity of the light, you appro approach a regime in which only one photon is going to be present in the beam splitter. And then you're going to only get a count in D1 or a count in D2. So just, you know, sort of programmatically, if you're careful, you're almost guaranteed to get into a regime where you're sort of self-validating that you have only one photon in the beam splitter at any one time. This is kind of how quantum experiments are done. It's not by pulling a magic rabbit out. It's just by thinking of you know, a simple angle. And indeed, uh, this is my last slide. How am I doing for time? Not more than an hour late. No, yeah, 13 minutes at a time. Uh, something, okay, what I just showed you, this beautiful, and yeah, tell Anton, once again, I said that, his device was beautiful, because I mean it. It's so, so elegant and simple. You get you buy a Walson prism from Edmund Optics, get an LED from Walmart, a photon detector, so that's another, in, in another form of diode, avalanche photodiode, and then a circuit box. You could, hobbies could. And it's, uh, it's a device, <coughs> there's a more, um, oh, okay. What's the, what's the value of such a device? Can someone suggest, if anyone's left in the audience, I can't tell, does anyone have a suggestion for the utility of such a device? Uh, key generation, I guess. Uh, yeah, that's that. That could be that you could, you could um, use that to generate a random. You could use you could use certainly use that to generate a sequence of zeros and ones because it's kind of like you've reduced the operating current. Let's say you reduce it to a point where only once every thirty seconds do you get a count. Then you could just like write down whether the count is a one or a zero. And the way that we've balanced the system by using the uh, 
of the diagonal polarizer, we should expect on the average, it'll be like a coin toss because the probability of a heads or a tails is 50%. So we should expect to get something that's uh, random. Uh, and, you know, binary random stream. Well, yeah, so NIST has actually established an online service. Uh, it's, it's based on a quantum random number generator of this type. It's not the one that I just showed here, which is the simplest implementation. But this one uses an entanglement-based source of, of photons, which allows for a stronger statistical test of randomness to be made. But it could be used as a, you know, a gambling device or a cryptographic key generator or more, you know, more uh, compelling from my perspective. It's kind of like, okay, what do we mean by random anyway? What, it's well known that it's really, really hard to make things random. So, for example, there's a paper 10 years ago looking at casino dice. You know, a die is supposed to, uh, when you throw it, it's supposed to land with one face facing up with a probability of one-sixth. But, you know, these the way these dies are made, they're a different number, there's a different amount of paint or whatever for coding, putting six dots in the face and just for one. So there's some biases. And there might be some other things. How do you how do you know things are truly random? Because you know you can certainly make plausibility arguments about processes that should be random. But from a philosophical from philosophical standpoint, how do you actually test it? I mean, I in my opinion, this may reflect my ignorance. I'm not a philosopher. But it seems to me that that remains a very fundamental question. For example, quantum mechanics does appear to be random within our ability to test. But how, you know, how do we know, how do we put bounds on the knowledge of that ability? And so this is, uh, this Beacon project can serve as a pragmatic tool to explore that. Uh, but then also, uh, and I'm at the end of this lecture, we'll see how quantum devices that, that employ uh, this form of randomness can generate secure one-time pad cryptographic key that, so far as it has been tested, uh, seems to be random from a cryptographic standpoint. Thus concludes my second lecture. I'll be happy to discuss things that follow on for the next eight minutes. I put out uh, some of the links for the uh, NISP some of the NIST pages, including the one you have up there. And uh, I was looking at, you know, uh, the documentation, I'm just kind of doing multitasking here. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, so there is a URL to get a, a pulse, quote unquote, at a specific unit, Unix time or index closest. Mm -hmm. So in practice, this beacon thing, uh, so I would use, take this URL, do a get or something, a W get or whatever, with a timestamp, a Unix formatted timestamp, and it would return to me a random value uh, yes, I mean, you can, I, I encourage, um, I can encourage an, anyone who's employed in IT to just have a look at this page. 
it's it it it's a pretty awesome demonstration of uh, use of a bunch of different shell scripts and protocols. But yeah, it's this um, this device is running autonomously, uh, and it 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 it's generating a um, <coughs> a continuous stream of numbers with that. You know, I mean, I, I think I'm saying this correctly. Uh, if not, my errors will quickly be revealed by reading the page. It, it generates a stream of numbers according to some specification, which is then also hashed with the time to give it, um, you know, a hash verified timestamp. And, you know, why is the beacon being broadcast? I think it's like, to expose, so, you know, here's the device that has been built by NIST as a potential randomness standard, and uh, there are at least two possibilities. Why did NIST do such a thing? One is to put out a putative answer to a question and see whether independent research conducted by any in the, anyone in the world can invalidate it. That would be useful, uh, useful numbers. The other is, and now I'm speaking completely hypothetically here, that is completely phony, and this is a mechanism for disseminating one-time pads to American spies around the world who are just downloading these one-time pads and violating this warning in red. Do not use beacon-generated values as secret cryptographic keys. Or, or it could be to distract North Korean intelligence into trying to figure out what the real purpose is. I'm just kidding about that other stuff. But basically, you know, there is really a... Um, there are many, many applications in which random number generators are incredible, truly random number generators are incredibly useful. A lot of simulations, you know, uh, solving logistics problems, the traveling salesman problems with all its variables. It's really, really useful to have a true random number generator that doesn't get one stuck in so-called hidden minimum. That was the, that was my answer to your question, Daryl. I just uh, yeah, I just ran an example. Uh, can I share it for a second? Yeah, please do. Sure. This is kind of cool. yeah. You can explain it. You probably you probably understand it. Well, the I can't explain it, but I can. Oh, share let me let I, me st let me stop. I'll stop my share. Yeah, um, but I'll just share. You know, I'm just I, I you know I I I'm trying to take it down to practicalness, uh, and so um, let me see. I'll share my screen real quick so people can see. Uh, so I've got a. You can see uh, a telnet, uh, an SSH session. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the URL, uh, one of the URLs, and then this is a Unix timestamp here. And I just do a wget, which is basically, you know, just go out to uh, the internet and get a file. So the file it returns is this bad boy here. I'll just cat it. So this is the contents of the file. So it looks like it's JSON, and it's giving me a bunch of goodies here, uh, and uh, to be looks, looked at looks later. Looks like looks like genuine hex on the screen there. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I'll, you know there's document there's documentation out there. So anyway, the point is that this operates, this works, and I'll put an example here. Uh, in the uh, chat, if anybody wants to play with it sometime or try to parse out what it what it it's for, but it works. It, I mean, it returns something. 
Well, maybe I'll tell some of the Beacon folks to get in touch with you, see about, oh. uh, you know, giving a little seminar on this. That and would be a bonus. And, and they, they can explain why the U.S. federal government is paying good money to send out this completely mean, mean it's certified to be meaningless, meaningless information. Gosh, I do meaningless things all the time. I don't know what kind of value that adds, but but I guess the Chinese it's one, one be, of America's greatest industries <laughs> doing meaningless things. Our competitors, if you will, would probably more, be more interested in this uh, meaningless than my meaningless. But yeah, yeah, that would be a great topic. I, I I don't know about the rest of the crowd here, but I know nothing about this. So interesting topic. Random beacon. I, it's new to me. But uh, yeah, any anybody else? You've got your microphones off out there. I don't know why everybody's so shy today. Must be sunspots or something affecting us on the Earth. Okay, well, uh, you know, I will address the survivors uh, tomorrow, same time, same bat channel on quantum cryptography. But this is now the tools are sort of in place to you know have defined kind of the, the, the encryption problem in a generic sense, and then to show how, in outline, the quantum solution can be used to approach it. But then the actual putting together of the cryptographic piece and the quantum mechanics is like a third step. And that's what we'll, that'll be the step we take tomorrow. Okay then, Charles, thank you again. Uh, appreciate you making time for us out here, and uh, uh, I'm learning a lot. Um, thank you. Yep. All right. Yeah, Thanks, everybody. Reactions out there, and we'll see you again, Charles. We'll see you tomorrow, and everyone else too. Same, same bat time, different bat channel though. We All right. The Zoom link. So we'll see you tomorrow, Charles. All thank right. you. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody.